So we will, um, so we hope today that we will be able to answer some of your questions and uh, Sophie will share some of her experience and expertise with us as well. So I will um, quickly do a, an introduction about who we are and then I will, um, and then I will hand over to Sophie to to take over for, for the rest of the session. Um, so just bear with me while I get the slide up and running. Please feel free to share with us in the chat box your name, your organization, and what you're really looking forward to from the session. Um, and then Sophie can also have sight of that and, and try to um, adapt and respond to to what you are specifically interested in. Okay, so let's start then. Everyone seeing the presentation? Are we all seeing the slides? Yes. Okay, sure. Okay, so um, as I said, our session today is focused on um, finding the, the right donors for your organization. And um, Sophie is our uh, guest presenter today who, who's, who has uh, strong expertise and experience in this area. Um, so just some ground rules around Zoom, you know, we've had some challenges with uh, Zoom hacking and all of that. Uh, we've tried to keep it as safe as possible, but we ask that when you're not speaking, kindly mute your microphone. Um, you're welcome to turn your video on or off, that's up to you. And then in the chat section, please let us know who you are, which organization, and as I said, if you have any thoughts for, for, the, for what you'd like to know specifically from this conversation, please do share. Um, you can also, um, just to confirm, please share your full name and email address in the chat, chat section so that after the session, we send you the recording as well as the slides from, uh, from the presentations. And then I just want to make sure because I, um, no, it doesn't have a, I don't think this has a raise your hand. Um, okay. Um, but anyway, we will, we will create space in the presentations um, when so as Sophie goes through it to have questions and some discussion. Um, so we won't wait until the end for that. Um, just so that we, we don't lose your, um, your track of thought on a specific issue. Okay, so um, Um, so the program is really simple. I will do a brief introduction about who we are um, and then I will hand over to Sophie. We will do the Q&A as I said as we go along and we'll also try and have some time at the end um, of, the, of the session. Just a little bit about who we are. So Tara Transform is a, is a consultancy that operates in the development sector. Um, we design, facilitate, and implement strategies in the areas of fundraising and sustainability, governance and leadership, as well as women's rights and gender. And um, 
a big part of why we exist is to advance social justice and social change. So our focus areas are leadership and governance. We help boards and executive leadership to build the skills and systems to ensure effective governance and sustainable and effective leadership. So in these areas, we do board training, we create board tools, uh, we mentor and support boards, and we also uh, support organizations on succession planning for boards and um, uh, executive leadership. On the fundraising part, we support funders to implement responsive philanthropic strategies. So we work with various funders in different ways. And we also build the capability of the nonprofit sector to be sustainable and impactful. And on gender equality and women's rights, we will support clients to build systemic and inclusive gender equality and enhance women's leadership voice and agency. And we, in this area, we, we work a great deal with, um, with UN agencies, for example, um, funders and, and NPO clients. So my name is Shireen Mutara, and I'm the founder CEO of Tara Transform. Um, I've been in the sector for going on 23, 24 years now. Um, I've worked significantly in the women's rights and gender sector, but I've also been an executive director and I have been serving on board since uh, the late 90s. Um, so I have a really good understanding of the sector. Um, the issues in the sector from, you know, from all, all levels, um, board, sustainability, leadership, and so on. Our team who has also joined us today is uh, Vuelwa, uh, is our project consultant. Um, I think some of you may have engaged with her. And Tawera is our ops consultant, whom I think some of you who have been confirming your attendance received um, the calendar invite from. We work with a range of clients across different areas, so private sector, funders, funder intermediaries, um, NPO clients, UN agencies uh, as well. And we, we do different pieces of work, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of pieces of work that we're currently doing. So we're working with a client to develop a new funding, a new fund model. So they're wanting to, um, to, to institute a fund um, in the country and they are, I'm helping them to design the model. And then we also uh, support a funder intermediary client on um, sub resource mobilization support, which includes fundraising strategies, planning, funder engagement, finding funders and supporting funder applications. Um, we also mentor um, through a funder client, a new NPO to support them in terms of their governance, their board, their finances and operations. And we've also done a lot of work on developing resources um, for the community-based organization sector. Um, we've, we're almost completing a piece of work, which is a, a basically a manual for community-based organizations, which covers all areas of running an, an, an organization or an NPO. And then we obviously also do these webinars and we've also been doing face-to-face -face training. Um, we find that that's important to support the sector to learn the kind of skills that are needed to be sustainable. So I also thought it's worth just reminding ourselves that, um, you know, we, we are in a different environment and a difficult environment at that. Things are changing and things are shifting. And I think there's nothing like COVID-19 to remind us that you know, change is inevitable. Um, so we also try to remind our NGO partners that, you know, it's important to take note of what's happening in, the, in your context, in your society, in your funders environment, so that you can be responsive to that. Um, so some of the things that I, we think are important to note are this idea of redirecting of resources. So while South Africa was very popular, say 10 years ago with funders, that's not necessarily the case anymore. And there are also other issues um, like migration and so on that are impacting funders' decisions around where they share, where they send their money. Um, we're also seeing that funding is declining. I think we're all aware of that, and that's a global thing. So it's not just South Africa. 
um, Africa has been affected and in South Africa, uh, particularly because we're seen as a middle income country, many funders are moving to other countries in the region. And then the, this, that links to this idea of shifting priorities. So we all see now with COVID-19 how funders are shifting and changing, adapting their strategies um, around how they use their money, their limited resources. But there have also been other areas like, um, you know, the, um, trade wars, um, conflict, um, issues of how countries engage with each other, what countries like or don't like about other countries and then and then how that informs um, what they decide around uh, around funding so our approach to funding is really about um, building capability you know i often say to clients i'm not i'm not here to just write proposals for you the way we work with clients is really to make sure that we build internal capability um, so even though we may be doing some things for the client, we try and do it in a collaborative way, in a co-creating way, so that we, we build long-term capability to ensure that the team, once we leave, the team is able to pick up from where we left and to continue to, um, to, to do the important work they need to do. And just in light of my earlier conversation with Sophie while we were waiting, um, I wanted to just show this again, because I think it's really so important that we understand that fundraising is not uh, waiting for a call for propo proposals and then writing a proposal on the day before. It's really a whole process end to end that you have to do well in order to make sure that you are successful. Um, so from, you know, the leadership, how the leadership drives fundraising and sustainability, um, is the strategy clear about what resource mobilization is going to look like? How are the board and executive team on board to support fundraising? Um, to making sure that you have all the things that are necessary, your governance documents, um, good, strong, fi uh, well, at least um, recorded financials, um, no problems with fraud and, and those kinds of things, to the things that I really feel are critically important for fundraising are around processes and systems. Because unless you institutionalize um, your fundraising, it's not going to work. If you do it as and when you remember and so on, you're never going to be a successful organization. So the institutionalization of processes and systems for fundraising can really help the organization to keep fundraising on the agenda and to make sure that everybody buys into what needs to be done. Um, and then the other thing I also want to emphasize is around planning and coordination. So I think a lot of fundraising falls flat because there's no you know, central planning and coordination around who's holding it, um, how are they directing it, how are they getting others involved, how are they speaking to programs and finance and so on to bring all the pieces together. Um, so that's that's also important. And then finally, the marketing and communication aspect. Um, in one of our earlier sessions, we had a presenter, uh, Michelle Hubert, speak to us about um, accessing CSI funding. But she also spoke about how important the marketing and communication aspect is. Uh, how NGOs put themselves out there. What kind of information are you sharing? Are you visible? Do you have a website or a Facebook page? Is it um, is it active, um, you know, because what now happens is when a funder hears about you, the first thing they're going to do is search for you on the internet. And if they don't find you or they find old outdated information, they may be reluctant to work with you. So I wanted to just emphasize the cycle as being critically important to seeing your fundraising as a, as a full circle process rather than a once off activity. Okay, then I just, before I end, um, also to talk, tell you that we, many of you are already part of our community. We have a community on Facebook um, called Tara Transform Fundraising Mastermind, and please join us. We, we normally share, uh, we try to share fundraising opportunities and also developments in the sector on a regular basis. That's just our, um, the members of our, of our fundraising group, uh, although it's primarily South African. And then just to say that this, this um, 
webinar today forms part of our broader program called your Get Your Fundraising Basics Done program. Um, we initiated this program to support NPOs to, to get the basics in place for their fundraising. So we're on the second last um, session of this program, um, but I just want to share some information quickly on what we covered in the program. So we've um, we've done uh, developing a fundraising plan. So we did a workshop on that, sharing with organizations how to determine fundraising targets and how to develop a plan and how to make sure that that plan responds to what they need. We've talked a bit about uh, developing a proposal, but really honing in on some of the things you need to be really clear about, like who's your target market? Uh, what is the context of the work that you are doing? How, being clear about your objectives when you write a proposal and so on. And then under understanding the funding landscape, we've done different uh, pieces of work. We've done the piece on CSI, understanding CSI. Uh, we've last, our last session was focused on crowdfunding with uh, Phoenix and Backer Buddy. And so this session is about um, using online databases and resources to find funders uh, and how to use that to, um, to apply. And then now um, the one session that we still need to have is about developing a budget, um, uh, you know, how to really look at that. And our, part, our partners are also able to access free fundraising opportunities for a 12 month period um, through this program. Um, so then before I hand over to Sophie, um, just to say that today's uh, class will focus on effective donor research, uh, how to use the available donor databases and resources, and also then how to use those two things to find the right donors for your organizations. Um, Sophie runs her own consultancy in terms of uh, fundraising and sustainability, but I will leave it to her to tell you more about um, who she is. Thank you. Um, so I will hand over to Sophie now to share um, her presentation and to start us off. Over to you, Sophie. Great. Thank you, Shireen. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. See if I can share my screen. Um, and Shireen, do I just click share screen? Because um, it's saying that um, it's been disabled. It's getting used to this technology. Okay, can everybody see? Great. Um, so yeah, thank you, Shireen, for this, and thank you um, to Tara Transform for the opportunity to um, to present this to you today. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful that I get to I get to just share a bit uh, about what I've found over the past um, ten years. Um, that's how long. Yeah, I've been over over ten years now working in the in the NGO NPO sector in um, specifically in South Africa. I moved. Um, from the from the UK in um, 2010, I'd studied international development studies um, at the University of Sussex, and then um, yeah, came to Cape Town um, and um, started off volunteering in a in a small nonprofit, and um, sort of just grew from there, starting with you know basic admin and um, working through sort of as as you do, as you all know, wearing many hats, um, getting involved in project management, um, finance training, online um, training, and then um, fundraising ultimately. And that's sort of the, the one that stuck and sort of I grew through a few various small to medium sized nonprofits um, as the fundraising manager. And then once I had my first child, I moved more into um, the working from home, so more of a fundraising consultancy um, and really forming a part of, of small to medium nonprofit organizations like their team and then sort of um, yeah, forming a space where people, as you know, their teams were so busy doing doing the the other side of fundraising that often grant grant writing and proposal writing is um, just people don't get, get have time to get around to doing. So that's sort of my main um, um, 
the, my main role in, in a lot of the NGOs I work with. And I just put some of them here. So you might know them, that, um, you might not, but um, yeah, mainly based in, in Cape Town and working in various areas of, um, of women and children, youth skills development, um, a bit of media, um, health, education. So quite a variety. Um, so that's, that's just a little bit about, um, about me. And like we said, feel free to just um, ask any questions um, as we go along. So I just wanted to, um, as Shireen has had already sort of introduced the topic, we, um, I think it's just important to, for us to, to realize that um, grants and, and proposals and this sort of um, finding donors this way is one, is just should be one aspect of your whole resource mobilization plan as an organization. Um, I think one thing it's important to realize is that is that grants don't come easily. They don't come overnight. They are, are um, tough to get when you're starting as an organization and um, tough to sort of get in there when, um, you know, d donors seem to, you know, fund people historically and, you know, things change in the sector. And um, so, so I think if you're a small, if you're starting a small nonprofit and, you know, we've got to think about the, the other areas um, where funding comes in um, and probably to build this up before you get to starting thinking about grant writing um, because without these things in place um, and without having built up a bit of a reputation and proving that you can handle money handle report writing all of those things then a donor that doesn't know you isn't necessarily going to fund fund you if these things aren't in place already so obviously we've got individuals and um, this corporate social investment um, online campaigns donations in kind i mean i could have made yeah, a huge list from this um, but i just wanted to emphasize the fact that um, grants um, and grant writing um, and it, obtaining funding from from um, foundations and um, philanthropy organizations that the, what they do is give out grants it, it's just a part of your whole um, resource mobilization plan um, as an organization. Um, so, I'm, as I'm sure you all know, grants, grants are lengthy processes. They require a lot of input, a lot of time, a lot of documents. And so you really need to be like set up and prepared for that before, before you know, even thinking even thinking about it and, and and making sure that you've got the right systems and processes in place and the right people in place and um, before before we can even think about like okay where do i find these donors um so and obviously there's such a huge range of of grant making organizations out there there's very small family-based trusts then um right up to like the um international um funders um you know the um the Ford Foundation, as for example, um, that will be funding like huge budgets and for multi-year grants. So there's such a wide scope and wide variety within um, proposal writing and grant writing that it's so important to know exactly who who you're talking to, who you're looking at, and like what what you need to have in place in order to reach those kind of um, levels. Um, so just to quickly, um, oh, and then I just wanted to, to really emphasize as well that with, with all of these, any way that you're gonna get any kind of resource into your, into your organization, to really always have at the back of your mind that it's actually at the end of the day, it's people that are giving to people. So it may be you're applying to, you know, an email somewhere out there in the ether, but at the end of the day, it's it's going to be a person that makes that decision whether you get the grant or not. And um, I think it's always important to you know to in the in the best way possible to um, to be able to um, to be have to have that in the back of your mind when you're writing a proposal, when you're um, getting those things in place. It's to be thinking like somebody is going to be reading this uh, and somebody's going to be making this decision and, so, and a, a board of trustees are going to be sitting around a table deciding on this. Um, so always to just be mindful of, of that, that you're wanting to connect what you're doing and, and your beneficiaries and who you're helping and your team with, with the potential funder and how to like bridge that gap 
well, that comes off well on a proposal. Because I guess the thing that's really different with the proposals is that is that you can't show you can't show the children you're benefiting. It's very different, um, and often that does happen as a part of the process. With big funders, they will come and visit at some point, and they will um, want to meet you and want to meet your team and everything. But um, some don't, you know, and it it might not happen for a few years or whatever. So it's what like it's how you get across what you're doing. Um, um, in a really um, succinct and um, um, a way that reaches people's hearts, even though it's just writing on a on a on a piece of paper. Um, so, um, so just wanted to emphasise that again that it's about people giving to people, um, and that's that's how <laughs> funding comes in. So, um, so just to quickly look at um, Sharina did go over this, and this has been covered in other webinars and other training. Um, but I think it's just important just to quickly, um, just to go over again, the, what, there's a lot of things that you need to have in place before you can, before you can think about finding, um, finding donors out there, um, unless it's going to be people that know about your organization. Um, and for grants specifically, you're going to need to have like the, the structures in place. So obviously you're going to need to have your registrations in place. Um, in South Africa, obviously, you need to have PBO status. That's very important for a lot of a lot of funders. Um, um, you're gonna, and what I just would stress as well is have this ready. Like um, Shirina said, you don't want to be doing it the night before, um, which very often does happen. But um, um, have these things ready. And what I would suggest, um, if you don't already, is have a file. Um, for all my clients, I have a even it's just a Word document where I put where I plug in all the information, all the organizational details, they always will ask for your address and your, your website and your contact details and your Facebook link and your, um, your director contact details and the project manager contact details. And it makes it so much easier when you have that ready and you can just cut and paste and copy and paste. You don't have to be finding like, oh, where's that number and where's this? And it's on hundreds of different pieces of paper around or um, on your computer. So it really helps just to like be prepared so that if a call comes up last minute, which at the moment it is happening with the COVID funding, you've got um, a few weeks or, you know, even a few days to get the information together, that it doesn't feel like a rush. It doesn't feel like a stress as much of a, as, you know, to make it as least stressful as possible. So have those, have those ready. Um, and then obviously all the project information, whatever you um, have on the project that, um, we obviously will go into this in, a, in detail in another session, but obviously all the information that is required in a, in a, in a project, have that ready, have your, have your concept notes, have your letters of um, um, intent, have your proposed, like have a um, draft proposal ready so that you can work from that as opposed to having to start from scratch, you know, have that, have that in place on file. And that's a really good um, process to go through anyway, to write it down and, um, and what I would even say is share it with somebody who doesn't know anything about your um, about your organization. Get them to read it and say, does this make sense to someone who doesn't know anything about what we do? Because we tend to use a lot of jargon, a lot of terms um, that you know people in the UK or in the US wouldn't understand what we mean by that. So, um, so that's just some things to have in place before we even look at the getting into the donors um, and finding them. Um, obviously, all the information about your beneficiaries, and this is one I really struggle with, with organizations, you know, is we need to have that information. You need to have the numbers of your beneficiaries, the race. It's so Im important for BE in South Africa. You need to have the age. You need to have how many disabled people. Like, have that information ready because they will, uh, like, funders will ask for it. They will want to know. And you need to have those numbers. You need to show that you have your ME in place. Um, so, and then obviously budgets, which we're going to do in another webinar, have that ready. Um, and you have, to, obviously, when with any grant writing, any proposal, you're going to have to adapt all of this. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a simple cut and paste. And budgets will probably be in a different form and however they, they want you to do it. But to have your, have the budget um, as detailed as possible, ready, so that you can then adapt it and then cut and paste and put things together for, for the actual um, um, proposal um, and then obviously m &E, you need like this needs to be in place a lot of um, big funders ask uh, grant making organizations are asking for very detailed monitoring evaluation what's your plan where's where are you getting where are you getting your um, your statistics from do you are you doing external evaluations and 
you know, build that into your budget as well when you're asking, you know, into the project budgets because more and more this is becoming um, in just very important. What, how are you proving your impact? How are you proving what you say is, is the change is going to be or how you're changing the lives of your beneficiaries? Um, and if you don't have that in place, um, then people aren't, they're not going to want to fund you, especially if it's organizations that are overseas, that um, it's not someone that is going to um, necessarily um, yeah, come and visit or all of those things. So it needs to come across on paper well um, what, what you're doing in the m &E space. Um, and then um, okay, obviously you're going to get this presentation as well, but just put a list of there. Like um, I, I have these on file for all my clients and I have note and then I note um, because often they need to be within three months of um, um, the date. So if you get if you get a bank account confirmation, you're going to need to get another one in three months. So I have it on the file and I remind whoever it is, is the finance, your finance manager or your or your accountant, whoever it is that helps you get this, this documentation together, just make a note on there. Okay, we need one in January, we need one in March, we need one and um, have it ready because it's so, um, it's, it's like these poor finance people run around having to go get these bank accounts and the bank statements and, um, and you're going to need those. Um, a tax clearance certificate is, is vitally important at the moment. A lot of um, South African funders are asking for that. So have it in place, make sure that you can get it access easily because um, you don't want to get to hearing a call for proposals and going through everything and then realizing like oh well we don't have a, our tax rent certificate or our BE affidavit is out of date now and we can't get to um, you know to go get it so and uh, you know certified ID copies of your board members who, um, staff members sometimes project managers are needed um, and have those people on file, have your commissioner of oaths that you know that you could just go to or you can just ask them to, to do it for you and um, and build a relationship with your bank, the manager at your bank and um, so that you can email and ask for it to be emailed to you as opposed to having to go into the bank, you know, just all these simple things to put in place to help, to just help you when, when those calls for proposals come up um, so that you're ready, you know, um, I think it just it just helps with the processes um and and obviously just to be a, just to be mindful that grants are not it's not a quick process it's um it's long term it's um investing and um the gains that you see it it often it takes years um to see that and it, it can be disheartening it can be <laughs> um frustrating and why are we getting the funding um, but I think what I would say is just is persevere and every time learn from your from the nose you get try yeah so I just want to say that up front okay so let's get into actually let's just stop there and have a um, any questions just on this section before we start looking at getting to the actual finding the donors um, you can yeah. anyone have any questions um, I'll just uh, Sophia, maybe I'll just uh, reflect some of the comments that we got earlier. Um, looking forward to hearing about finding donors in this COVID-19 era and beyond. Um, I would like to learn about donor research and how to find the right donor. Looking forward to finding a new donor and getting insights on what have been the shifts made by donors in the last year. Uh, looking forward about learning to find the right donors to access. Uh, I'm interested in knowing how we must shift our thinking and our strategies in light of so many organizations in an emergency mm. state and needing so much more funding than usual. I think that many of <laughs> many organizations are yeah. struggling with that. Yeah. Um, I wish then, I had all those answers. Yes, and there's somebody asking, uh, to me, she was asking, what is the difference between an NGO and an NPO legally? Okay, and um, this is coming up a lot at the moment. I'm seeing it all over the, the mm, Facebook mm, groups. And mm. so, so um, just to clarify, the N, an, NG, an NGO is an international term that we use for any non-governmental organization. And in South Africa, there's no there's no legal um, registration or documentation for an NGO. It doesn't exist. The MPO is a non-profit organization, which is where you register with the Department of Social Development and you get your MPO number. 
and you need that for any funding. Um, so even all the other registrations, you'll, you'll need to have an NGO number. Um, it's a, like um, to, to have that. Um, then how you, how you set up as an organization, um, you will either um, as a trust, as a voluntary organization, or as a nonprofit company. Okay, so that's your legal status and basis as an organization. And that will, and each one of those comes with different um, legal um, responsibilities and um, your, um, how you set up in the board and all of those sort of things. Um, but that's, um, that's where, uh, and, and it's becoming, it's becoming very, I don't, I don't know where this has um, come from. Um, and, and an MPC, someone's asking, um, an MPC more credible? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. A nonprofit company is definitely more credible to funders than a, than a voluntary organization because there's so much more required in terms of um, your the legal responsibilities. You have to do an annual report um, to the CIPC every year. Um, and a voluntary association, you, you just come together and you have a board, you put together a very basic constitution um, and there's not as much in terms of the responsibilities. Um, so it definitely is um, more credible. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get funding if you're a voluntary organization, um, but it's, it's, you're just putting yourself out there as a more um, credible organization and um, yeah, I mean, a lot of um, organizations start off as voluntary organizations and then perhaps in the future progress to um, registering as a, a nonprofit company. So it's got to be where you're at as an organization as well um, and needing to be ready for that because then it comes with um, you're going to need money to to um, employ someone to help you with the, the registrations um, and that sort of thing. Um, does that make sense? So, yeah. And just to say, there's a lot of scams going around with you needing an NGO certificate. So that is all, um, it's not, um, yeah, not true. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay, cool. Let's move on. Thanks, Marisol. Okay, so um, moving on to, um, so before, obviously, um, there are thousands and hundreds of, thousands of organizing and um, funding bodies out there so you need to know before and what are you looking for so you need to know um, your project or your program what funding are you looking for um, is it specifically for a project that is a once-off um, more of a um, start and a finish um, or is it a program funding that is more rolling and annual funding that you're looking for multi-year funding um, is it organizational core funding that you're needing um, that's that is um sort of the the gold to find out there which which um <laughs> which organizations fund that um is it you know once off one year and um, multi-year funding and then the budget so you need to know um it helps to know as well your budget in if you're looking at um, the us in dollars look at uk in pound like so you in pounds so you know when a call for a proposal comes up and they say oh we are offering a, the grant is between 15,000 and 30,000 Canadian dollars which is one I was doing this week you need to know what that is in round you know you need to so you need to know um it does this fit in with our budget when a call for proposals comes up um and then secondly obviously then you need to know what theme is under is it education is it health um is it training um and then who who are you looking for? Is it youth? Is it women? Is it children? You need to know these things um, beforehand. Um, and then how, how are you implementing your project? Is it a project where you're working with beneficiaries on the ground? Is it advocacy? Um, you know, are you, are you trying to change things in the, in the government sector? Are you providing services? There's a lot of funding out there for, um, or, you know, potential for organizations to offer services as well. So there's, um, there's a lot of different, areas that um, a call for proposal can come up and um, that you could you could potentially apply for um, in these areas so um, let's look at this where to start okay so my like advice um, oh, to, just before as well you um, you starting with doing the research have your own 
um, start making notes, have your own database ready, have an Excel spreadsheet or however it is you do it um, to be able to, whenever something comes up or you hear about something, pop the information in there. Um, when you see a call for proposals and you think, um, oh, we're not quite ready for that this year, but maybe, you know, maybe for next year, because um, they often come around again, same annual cycle, um, pop, get, get that information in there. And um, when their deadlines, you know, they're often, often um, like, they have the same deadline every year. So like put that information in so that you have it ready whenever um, whenever you need to and then the donor information. So so start your own database. And even if it's just very brief notes um, that you saw this come up and um, remind yourself for next year, put it in your calendar. Um, I've got you know a calendar at the beginning of the year, like with the ones I know that come up in an annual cycle and um, to apply for again. Um, so just ha like have all this stuff sort of ready so that when when you do come across um, something you can just pop it in there and um, you know you know you've documented it and especially for um, if you work with a team or if you know you're not you're not going to be there this time next year like have it already so that it's, it's part of the organization's um, information and um, to have okay so I would Let's just look at some um, physical databases. Um, and I, I wanna just put a disclaimer out that I'm very biased towards the, um, towards the one that I wanna talk about um, because I've looked at a few and I've used a few over the years. And um, the one thing to talk about with, with databases is they are out of date almost immediately. <laughs> and if you purchase one, if you buy one, they go out of date and people change and um, the organizations change, what they're looking for um, and that, that happens like on a con like constant basis. These need is these are needing to be updated. Um, so I just wanted to put one out there that um, that I have used and have looked at in your tello. And I don't know if you all know them, but they're um, based in Cape Town and they have offices in Woodstock. And obviously, at the moment, you know, we can't all just be going down to their offices. But um, in a usual context. Um, you can go to their offices and um, sit and they've got an MPO and space and you can use their funding finder database for free. You can sit there and use it and trawl through it and have a look who's out there. Um, and I've done that and it's, it's a really, it is a great resource, but if you um, want to buy it, it's a 12 month subscription and for nonprofits, it's 1,725 around at the moment. Um, and it's a great um, database. So, um, but one that I would, I want to talk about and want to look at now is um, Papillon Press. They, um, I, I don't know how many of you know them, but Jill Ritchie is, um, is like a funding guru. Um, she has written numerous books and resources and she's, um, she's been around in the fundraising space for, for all, all the years. Um, and she's developed this database that um, covers um, seven areas so um, I'll just go through it quickly with you. Um, so um, it, let me just get the seven areas. So there's a there's a South African um, database that um, is separate with corporates, companies, with trusts, and with embassy donors. So that's specifically for um, South African donors. Then there's a Northern Donor Directory that they've developed. So that's the UK, the USA, Europe, and the rest of the world. So in total, they've developed seven databases. Um, that come separately as part of the um, database. And what's really great about, about this database is the fact that they, um, as best as possible, they keep you updated. So I'll just show you, um, um, how do I get out of this? So I'll just show you um, an example. So this is the um, corporate database um that comes with it um and this is just to show you an example so it comes can everybody see that maybe just to people no, we can't see it oh okay um I wonder is, what... is it on your desktop yes uh, maybe stop share and then open a new share okay uh, I, i'm not so sure but uh, let's try that can you see this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is what the database looks like. Because um, I think it's great to see it before you purchase this sort of thing. Um, because you just don't know what you're going to get. And I didn't know what I was going to get when I purchased this. So this is just one of the seven databases. 
um, and it comes in this sort of form with the code, the company, um, what is the approach method, um, how do you approach them for the funding, what sector um, do they fund, what area, um, so is it national, is it just Houteng, is it just urban, um, the website, um, the name of the contact, um, their title, I'll just keep going through, email address, um, a peer box and the addresses and the telephone number. Um, so it gives you all this information. Um, and what's really nice as well is you can see here um, in bold, all the ones that are bold have an actual application form that is available like online or um, on their website. Um, so if you look through here, I'm just trying to find one now. Um, First National Bank Fund. So you go, and that's actually um, Chickalulu. Um, so you can go to the website and, and then that's where the form is. So what's really nice about this um, database is that um, if you, what I would suggest or what I, what I would do is go through and find all of the ones that actually have application forms and processes in place already um, because it's the sort of easiest way to start with, with grant writing um, because there's a process in place, they probably have a deadline, it's very clear like whether you can apply or not right at this time, whereas other ones are going to be, you're going to have to um, try and send a, a letter of intent or a proposal which is um, can come at any time of the year and the, the what they find might change. So that's what one thing that I really like about this database. Then the other thing I really like is the fact that this code here um, um, relates to, um, so this is just a code that obviously anyone who's got the database will know. And on their website, the Papier and Press website, they will um, regularly update. I mean, it hasn't been done for a while now since October because they're still in their, um, the um, processes, the um, changing the way they do things a little bit. But um, so, for example, I'm one of the people that will share whenever I find information that is outdated on this database with the Papillon Press team, and then they will share it on their website. Um, I can also just show you that quickly so you can see. Um, um, Shireen, can you see the screen now? Let's try it. Yeah, no, I didn't see Okay, it. I think I have to just keep switching. Yes, please. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, sorry guys. Um, so this then is the um, Papel and Press website. Um, so I'll obviously I'll share all this, um, we'll, we'll give you all these links and everything. Um, but you go to their um, donor directory updates and here um, their changes, um, so they usually do it every, every um, month. So we'll be updating it soon. So they'll show you, here's the code for the staff and corporate donor directory. So now this person, this is the right one now, this is the right contact person, and you then can update it yourself. You just copy and paste this into your, um, into your database. And I haven't found any other donor directory that does this. I haven't found um, anyone that will give you updated information. Obviously they can do it on an annual basis, um, but this is really nice for like month to month um, information. Um, and there are people out there who give, you know, who give this information back to them. And um, so, um, yeah, that's just one one database that I would really recommend for um, for South African donors. So if you, you know, instead of having to go to every single web, you know, try and find who the corporates are there out there, what are they funding at the moment? You can just um, you can just go to um, the directory and you. Um, yeah, search for them, see what they're funding at the moment. Um, do we fit in with them? And then from there, go and, go and do the research. Um, so it's a really great resource. Um, so we can, yeah, we can do questions at the end about that. Um, but I'd also just want to, um, to say as well, so then they, one thing that they're really strong on because of um, Jill Ritchie's contacts and her experience of in the UK there's a there's um, a huge I mean this this is the UK donor database um, and it is massive I mean it's like huge and all of these funders at some point in time have given to South African organizations and give to South Africa um, again it's it's changed a lot um, I going through this you realize like a lot of a lot of these have changed a lot of them don't give to to south africa anymore but there's still a lot out there that do so it really um 
got me excited <laughs> to to find this you know this one that like you know you can you can go um you can go through um and we talked about this a little bit um Shirino and i um just before we came on the webinar and one thing um that um some some of these uk trusts particularly want to fund a uk um registered charity that then will 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 come to come to south africa the money so one thing that um that joe ritchie has established is the um, uk fund for charities and they are basically a funding conduit um if you need a uk number or if you have any uk donors you can claim 25 percent um gift aid um, on any donation that comes from a UK taxpayer. So if you have a potential for any UK donations or you want to start up uh, crowdfunding or, or um, um, something, you know, online um, campaign or you know you have don potential donors in the UK, um, it's a really um, great resource because you join for £100, um, um, which is, um, what is it, the about 20... 2000 what's that 2000 rand um and and then you can then you use their uk charity number to apply for these funds um so that's definitely something to look at um for for um, for just as you know another area um of of fundraising especially with the uk um trusts um so that's that's just my experience of a data database that is very comprehensive it covers because it covers um the us the uk um um, um, um around the world it's sort of i haven't found anyone that isn't on the, you know that isn't on there already um around that i just see someone's got a question yes also us fund for charities okay it yeah maybe you could tell us a bit more about that um well at the end oh are you asking if there's is there a, there is a u.s fund for charity cool. we'll talk about I, um, um so yes. i think we um we bought uh, the database recently and it included a u.s database from yes. papillon yes yes mm -hmm. okay is that the question okay yes um, I thought you were asking if if they also offer it, like the 501c, um, but that's a yeah sort of a different um, different topic. Um, yes, there is a US one. Um, I can um, yeah. So there's seven seven in total. Um, and what's really great if you buy all um, all seven, it's 800 rand for the Excel um, Excel spreadsheet spreadsheets, um, or you combine them as one. They're like one page A4 um, per donor, um, but I don't think you need that information. To, to me, like the Excel spreadsheets are great because then you can edit them, you can add your own notes, you can, you know, delete them when you know, or, you know, move them out of your list when you know, you know, you don't fit in with them. Um, and it's very easy to, to drop, um, to search for who looks who looks at your topic if you're just looking for education um, you can you can easily um, eliminate all the others um, using the excel spreadsheet um, so that's just what i would really recommend in terms of buying a database um, yes well you're right so any um anytime so we'll go on to that so when you think you found one so you'll look on here um and see okay this person you know they may potentially we fit in with what they're looking to fund um and then you will definitely go and find out the rest of the information so you'll then go to their website you'll um wherever you can find the information go to the um for the uk the charities um commission and you'll go and see there who is the right contact person have they changed their um application form um, what is their process right now and then definitely any contact you can make um, is is um, vitally important so you pick up the phone you send an email um, if you're not sure if it's not clear from the website or clear from the application form what you need to do um, then definitely get in touch um, in any way um, that you you know you have the information so 
and um, quite often, you know, they, they're very open to chatting through, um, we're thinking about applying, like, do we, you know, should we apply? Um, we don't, um, do we fit in with this, you know, category, we don't have this, or, you know, um, people are open to um, giving that information, or they'll just say, check the website, or, um, and it's really, really important to do that research, because you'll waste so much time doing, doing the application that you think you're um, eligible for, and then it turns out you weren't, because you didn't read the, the small print, or you didn't check through all of the requirements first, before you did the application, um, and then it wastes, you know, wastes a lot of time um, that way. Um, okay, so that's sort of the database I'd recommend, and there's loads out there. So if you know if you want to share ones that you have found that work work for you in your organisation, then please do. You know, this is about sharing our resources and sharing what we found works. You know, this one I just just works for for me. Um, then I just want to talk through um, um, online databases because there's a lot of resources out there also. Um, let's just share the screen with you. So this, um, I don't know how many of you know about this one. Let me just share it again. Sorry, lots of moving around. Okay, this is funds for NGOs. How many of you use this, know this one? Anyone? Um, we use it. Okay, um, so this is a really great free resource. So this is a, this is the free one. Um, here it's called uh, Funds for NGOs. Um, this is the free one. Um, and what's really great about this um, this database? Can everyone see that? Is um, you can you can very specifically look for what you know what area you're looking for. So it's children, education, HIV AIDS, those sort of things. Um, and you can then also filter through um, so that like finding the South African ones. So then you just look, okay, this is in Malaysia, doesn't apply. Um, you have to sort of, you know, look through these are the latest ones that come up. And this is where like a lot of the, you know, COVID funding is coming up, the international ones. And, you know, this is the um, calls for proposals that are coming up um, um, on a, on a, um, What's the word? Um, regularly, coming up regularly. Whereas obviously your donor databases um, are it's static, you know, they're static. Um, but these are the ones that will, it will be a new call will come up. So this is a really great online resource that I use a lot. Um, and actually um, with one of my clients, we have the um, paid version. There's a premium version as well. Um, so if you do want to, and this is more like sort of getting into, like I said, like the, the international space and when when latest calls come up that won't be on your donor database, they won't, um, you won't necessarily know like, okay, that one's coming up right now. Um, and the um, premium version is, um, looks like this. Can you still see this? Um, I'll just assume until somebody says. So this is the funds for NGOs Pro, um, and I th think we got it. I think it was ninety nine dollars for the year. Um, they're always doing like fifty percent off that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's about one thousand seven hundred grand. Is that right? Um, but um, it's really great because what it does is I. Email every day with the latest opportunities that are coming up specifically for South Africa. So you put in into this um, database what what your organisation is looking for. So if it's not South Africa, if it's somewhere else, and then that comes in um, an email every day. Um, and then there's a really nice donor search here. So you could be very specific in what you're searching for. Um, you put in your country that you're, um, and then it only comes up with the ones that are relevant for South Africa. Because what I find with a lot of these online ones or the very American ones is, it's very often they're not funding South Africa. So you're wasting a lot of time just looking through, finding, oh, they fund education, oh, but they don't fund South Africa. So, um, so this is a really great one. And then all the, the latest ones will be here around the world. And again, you'll just look, okay, India, that's not relevant, India, um, this one could be relevant. Um, and then also all the foundations, just in general, the latest donor information is here um, that, that get added and like who they fund and everything. So this is a really, a really great online resource that I use a lot. Um, and I, I would recommend 
you know if you have the resources to also um um for yeah for current opportunities um it's a really great resource um, and it has been beneficial to have the paid version as well because you just you don't you're not always on the ball with when the call for proposals are coming up um, so this is one I would recommend there are a lot out there um, Sharina also mentioned um, DevEx um, which is another one um, that I haven't had a lot of been, um, uh, experience with but if anybody else has it well you know we can share that at the end but that's another really great resource um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention on the funds for NGOs, even the free one, there's a lot of great resources. This is great for, and um, they give you um, um, free downloads, um, let's move this here, um, training manuals, toolkits, how to write um, letters of intent, how to write proposals, so any kind of resources you could need. And this is really great for really thinking about the international um, Sphere um, arena as well because there's a different language you've got to use a different understanding of what they're potentially looking for like how we communicate what we're dealing with in South Africa and so this is really helpful um, whereas obviously if you're applying to a CSI company in South Africa they they already have a good understanding of what what the, the issues we're facing are what what life is like um, for our beneficiaries so I think um, I think this is a really great one like a good reason source for sort of um, being able to explain that to a more of an international audience and um, so that's what I'd recommend um, for an online one and again free or paid like it's worth um, use the free one and see you know see if you like it and, and and then look at look at you know look at getting the premium later um, then there's another really nice one um, I want to share with you if I can get my uh, um, this is one, I have no idea how I came across, across this one, but this is called peakproposals.com. And again, it's an, I think, American-based site, but it's got really great resources, really great um, courses um, and um, funder lists. And now that this is one thing, it's a free list. I'll just find it here. You go to um, resources and then you can they break it down into different um, continents and then you can go specifically to Africa funding resources and then here um, this is all the sources of um, funding in agriculture so here's a whole list here um, again it's all very international organizations but it's you know good to see what's out there what's possible um, conservation disability services education and again it's for the continent of Africa so it might not um, you know, necessarily be South Africa, but um, but it's definitely worth, and um, this is a really good um, list and resource as well to just go through. And then again, they have a paid um, option to look at um, like just just for South Africa, which is also a really nice resource. Um, um, here, this is um, 100 funders for projects in South Africa. I mean, it's $12, um, so it's not, not, not too much pricey, um, but it goes through again, all the different um, areas that you're looking at. Um, uh, checklists, uh, that sort of thing. So this is a this is a really nice resource as well if you like having something a bit more pretty looking. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is another great great one that I go to a lot. Um, uh, and look here, even um, you can go down and look at what is out there for COVID nineteen at the moment. Um, this is um, resources again. This is quite American, so. Um, it might not be, you know, might not be for South Africa, but you don't know. I mean, we don't know until we go and look and do the research and what's out there. Yeah, for US-based nonprofits, um, funding opportunities um, are open to organizations outside of the US. So, um, so this is another one, peak proposals that I use a lot. Um, just checking. Okay, good. I'm glad people, um, I was hoping I was going to share something that people didn't know about. Um, good. And now let me just show you another one. Um, this is a really, a really random one. It's actually, this is Welsh. Um, Kumra is, is Welsh. That's um, Wales in Welsh. Does that make sense? This one is a really nice website. So again, I'll share the link with you because it's a sort of random, a random name. Um, this one again, um, it's quite a lot about how about but it's about Wales and Africa so there's a lot of um, information here for African um, countries um, and this international funding list I've actually used a lot because it gives you 
Um, let me just find um, this is information about it. But they have a list on here. Oh, here we go. So here, this is new grants in response to COVID-19. And then it will tell you, what's really nice, it tells you exactly type of project, um, location. So do we fit that? No, it's not for South Africa, grant size. Um, and they, they will have the ones that are um, immediate, like the, there's a call right now, like here's one here, Women's Voice and Leadership Fund, Rapid Response Grants. Sharina, did you know about this one? You should be applying for this one. Um, 20,000. Have yeah, you seen yeah, we we read um and we read partners who've applied for it. It's uh, okay. It's actually funded by the Canadian government. Yes, um, but through uh, gender links is the okay the intermediary. Yeah. And how did you hear about that one? Uh, the I think the first time I saw it from funds for NGOs in okay. one of their okay. alerts because I get those yes. alerts in my email. Yes. But then also uh, I think Tawera received an email about it and she shared it with us. Okay. Colleague. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. So this is just another one. Um, and then and again, with up, updated information, can be anywhere in Africa. So here's another development fund. And then it goes, um, and it, what's nice is it gives you the ones that are open now, or like coming up for um, a call for proposals. And then it will also give ones here, new funding sources, May to December. So these are all the ones that are open ending May. So you're like, okay, great, we can get this one in. We haven't got time. Um, PEPFAR, um, this one. Uh, ending June so it gives you like so you can look look to the future and think okay we could apply for this we've got till September um this one it, yeah so this is also really nice it could it could just be in you know information isn't out there and what's nice about this one is it gives you a little bit more information um about about the the proposal um what's coming up um so keep your eye out on that you know that they're not funding South Africa at the moment but you don't know comic relief do fund South Africa um, and then these ones that are ongoing, ongoing international funding sources. So these might not be in the in the directory I have or other places. So um, so these are also ones that are open all year round um, to have a look through. Um, so that's another nice um, online updating updating one. Is that the right word? Yeah. Um, so these ones, these ones are all funds in Africa, Chrysalis Trust, Hilden Charitable Trust. So have a look through these and just see, oh, do we fit in? Um, and what I've found, what's quite nice, that the UK Trust have a lot of, um, um, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm just looking at the comments now. Um, the UK Trust have a lot of, um, they have a, usually a very simple application process if they have an online app or an email application um, form and, you know, it's often quite a simple thing. And then they'll, they'll be looking for maybe 3,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds, looking at that sort of um, um, grant size, and often quite small and that sort of thing. So there is a lot of opportunity out there for, for funding from, from the UK still, um, even though it is declining and it has changed, like you said, over the past 10 years. Um, but those are just a few online resources. And what I would say is like, like just, um, don't try and use all of them all at once and you know you suddenly feel overwhelmed oh so much out there but like just find something that works for you for your organization for your team maybe you if you've got more than one fundraiser one of you can look be the funds for NGOs person and one of you can be you know the on the um the data the excel database you know sort of split up the roles um, so you don't feel so overwhelmed um yeah so those are just some of those ones i just go back to the, um, oh, also then, let's just have a look here. Um, so these are the online databases we looked at. Um, and then obviously then there's the actual um, funders themselves. So um, Ch Chikalulu is one which I go to regularly just to check that they're not open at the moment um, and they they then cover big big um south african corporates like fmb discovery first round rmb big banks um they they will be the all the applications go through chikalulu so go on there regularly and just check because they've now got just one page for all the funding that is open right now um, um which isn't there's nothing open at the moment um 
it's all yeah they're all figuring out what they're doing with related to um, COVID-19 so um, that's just one just I just regularly check on there um, if anything is open um, and then obviously you're going to just um, keep on the pulse with the individual funders especially ones that you know um, could potentially fund you um, you know you just got to keep checking go back to the website check have they updated have they um, changed what they do and I'd really actually just want to stress as well, like getting in contact with them. I did a proposal recently uh, last year for um, growth. What do they, is it future growth or growth? The properties company, oh, I've totally forgotten now. Anyway, but they, they had no, they had very little information or their information on their website was very outdated, but they still said, this is our application process. This is what we need to do. So I was like, great. So I did the application and it came back and they said, actually the only funding uh, um, in a very specific, it was for um, learnerships, teacher accredited learnerships in property, you know, that was going to be, that's what they were going to fund at the moment. But they didn't tell you that on the application process. So um, I realized the next time I called and said, is this still the case? And they said, yes. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to apply for it again. Um, so it is really important because stuff is outdated. Website, you know, websites aren't up to date. Application forms are often, you know, it's the wrong one on there, whatever. So make those calls. Um, yeah. Um, so I would just say that, um, and then, okay, so let's just quickly, um, just go to the other, just look at this, and then we'll go to those questions then, um, that's okay. Um, so then just some other resources or where where I find out like when a call for proposal is coming. Um, there's some great, obviously I'm sure most of you are part of these because that's how you found out and you know about um, Tara Transform um, and about this webinar. But the SAMPO Facebook page is a great, these great groups that people are now more openly sharing like, oh, I came across this grant, I came across this call for proposal. Um, the fundraising mentoring MPC um, Facebook group is also, they share a lot of information on there. So please join. And that's Frank Julie here in Cape Town. Um, and it's a 250 round annually. And there's a lot of, lot of great resources that come with that. And then what I would say is just keep up to date, keep on top of the individual grant making organizations that know, that you know, like the national lotteries, Keep um, follow their Facebook pages, follow their Twitter feeds, um, because they up update them on on there. I mean, obviously, you probably all saw the the, um, the recent COVID fund that the NLC had, and I was like ready, waiting to see. Like, as I said, I was going to release the information in a few days, so you need to be on the ball with that. Especially with people like the lotteries, they're open again now. On the apparently on the fourth of June, they shifted again for their annual regular funding. And with the lottery, you have to get in there early. You need to be one of the first organizations on their desk um, because they run out of funds. They only have an annual budget and they run out. So you need to know, um, keep on the pulse with those um, with those ones um, to make sure that you're in there um, on time. Uh, and then others like um, survey philanthropies, are quite a, they started opening up um, an annual I mean an application form and they keep regularly they update their Facebook page letting you know like we open okay we're closed like they just said now they haven't managed to have their board meeting because of um, the lockdown so please wait and all of that stuff so so when you see when you know about um, potential funders then follow them keep up to date keep um, on them and you know they'll they'll also see you so comment on their posts comment on the stuff make sure that they know about you as well like Shireen was saying at the beginning like it's about marketing as well as fundraising because they're going to want to know they're going to want to have heard of your organization by the time the proposal comes onto their desk they're going to want to know who you are who have heard oh I've heard the name around um, as opposed to just never have, you know hearing from you before um, and then again another way to look for potential funders is to go to organizations that do similar work to you that are in the similar area or and um, doing similar things and go to their websites see who funds them um it's it's open information it's not you know it's not trying to steal donors from each other but it's about um sharing you know sharing those resources um, a lot of funders will fund for one year two year three years and then they'll be looking for new organizations that do similar work um, uh, or, you know, on, on annual reports and financials, um, annual financial statements, um, organizations share who their funders are. 
Um, and it's about then, um, you know, then finding out, okay, the, this is a potential funder. Is, are they open at the moment? Would they be open to, you know, to looking at a new funder? And then referrals, obviously, it's a massive, massive resource for getting, for getting funding, especially, you know, from like to like organizations and from, you know, other donors. That's one way that, you know, your current donor can say, look, we, you know, our grant cycle is coming to an end and, you know, have those conversations. Is there another um, donor um, that you know of that that we could potentially apply for? Can you give us a good referral? Can you, um, you know, recommend us? Um, so I have those have those conversations. Have those, um, yeah. Ask those. You know, you can only ask those questions. Um, and people are, you know, other donors are usually more than happy to do steer, you know, steer you, steer you into the the arms of other donors as well. Um, Okay, so then just quickly, obviously we've talked about this a bit, but when you find a potential funder, get all the information you can, um, who they fund, how much they fund, what do they fund, um, what is the application process, what do they want specifically. If they're asking for a letter of intent and they say, you know, it's only two pages, make sure it's only two pages. Um, um, what they ask for in the proposal, make sure you write what they're asking for, not just send your generic proposal. You know, you've got to adapt, you've got to, um, you know, Go with what they're asking for. Um, contact um, contact before you send it. Find out when the due dates are. Make sure you've got those in your calendar, and try not to leave it to the last day, which you know is not always easy. But I've had you know issues with online forms that don't work on the day, and you know and you're stuck, you know, and you've got a deadline. So try yeah try to be pre pre anticipating these. Prepare the proposal documents in time. So that's when you find. Um, and then, so I just would just say like, find one platform or one, you know, one database. Don't try and get all of them at once and try to start rolling through them because it's like, it's time consuming. So just find something, yeah, you know. Um, keep up to date with what's going on, what's going on in the sector, what's going on in funding, who's funding what, what people are changing, what they're looking for, um, that sort of thing. And then keep your records. So once, you know, have it all in a database, who you applied to, when when did you apply, what did they say, um, did you ask them for feedback? And I mean, a lot say like, you know, we just didn't have enough money, but you can always say, can we apply again? You know, when you open again, um, would you recommend us applying again? What would you recommend us doing? Um, yeah. So yeah, and what I, I just put the, well, it's supposed to be a tortoise, but I guess the turtle, but just keep applying, you know, like you've got a grant writing, it's, it can take a few years to get any, any, <laughs> any money in. So you've just got to keep going, keep plugging away. I did a proposal recently for a, a client and they've applied. I think this was their third time they'd applied. And, um, and then we got the funding the third time around, you know, so it's, you, you can feel so disheartened and you know the first time no the third, second time no the third time you know it was a yes and and amazingly it was i think it was about a hundred thousand rand and it was supposed to all go towards equipment and medical equipment and now they've come back and said that that the organization can use it for covid um related to cover some salaries and cover some you know organization costs so so it's it turned out to be like really really valuable funding um that yeah, that you think oh, we've done, we've applied twice already. So um, keep going, keep applying. Um, yeah. So, um, Shireen, you asked a question about um, corporates. Let me see the questions. Yes, I wanted to find out how do you find it applying to corporates and. Um, do you communicate with them or at all or just apply? Uh, how, how do you find that process? Yeah, I mean, I have found from, from my experience with corporates that they generally, it's like, um, especially if they're a bit more well established, the process is out there. The application process is already set in stone. Um, so you can call and say like, is this still right? Is this still the right contact person? That sort of thing. Um, and then you just follow the process. Although, if they are ones that are more open to um, just sending a proposal or sending, you know, sending a letter of intent, then then there will be a lot more interaction because you can then say, okay, what what are you looking for, or um, what information should I put in, um, and a bit more like then a bit more um, communication. Um, but the ones that have got an application process, I found that you know they just say, 
do the application and then we'll let you know. Um, that's just sort of, yeah, been, been my experience. I don't know if anybody else wants to share their experience. Okay, thanks so much, Sophie. Um, I think that was very useful. Before um, I, I hand over to people to ask questions, I just wanted to ask you to, um, can you take us through a day in the life of a fundraiser? So, you know, I, I want people to get an understanding of how do you, you know, you working for other clients, uh, how do you go about finding the funders what what do you need to know from your clients first before you can start a process to support them yeah so it was it was interesting to me how long it took um with a new client to be able to say okay now i can do some fundraising on your behalf because there's so much um institutional knowledge in organizations or people have so much of an understanding when you've been working for your organization or you founded it or you've been running it you know what's going on you know um, so what's a really good process actually is having someone come in that doesn't know about your organization, you know, and I then have to understand it to be able to then communicate it to a funder. So it involved, you know, visiting the projects, visiting the, the work on the ground and then gathering all of the information. So I will, um, when I work with new organizations, I'll do a whole like fundraising audit. So I'll go through all your documents the, um, and marketing online, what, what do you have out there for a potential donor to read and to see? Um, and then I'll, then I'll come up with all, um, this is what's missing. So you need to have, you need to have annual financial statements or, you know, you need to go get your PPO status or, you know, you need to um, have an annual report or, um, okay, you don't have a tax clearance certificate. Why don't you have that? Let's work with the accountant to get that. Um, so I'll, I've got a checklist that then I'll go through and then I'll, then I'll start working on, um, the concept notes or the, the, the sort of um, basic proposal that then we can use and adapt if they don't have one if they have one i'll then work on okay we need to you know add this in edit this so editing the proposal so then all of that information is ready so then then you can start doing the research side of it and seeing okay now we can start matching matching the donors um, does that make sense Yes, um, I think that's very really useful. There's a question, what's the ideal duration or time to make a follow-up on a submitted proposal? Yeah, um, How long yeah, is that's, of <laughs> yeah, exactly. So obviously um, these things take time, like um, um, they, you're not gonna hear back within a few days. So if they tell you like this lotto funding now we've just applied for for the COVID-19, they said you'll hear in June. Um, so maybe you know, a few, you know, a few days or a few weeks into June, we can um, give a call or follow up if you haven't heard anything. Um, one thing I would say is always check that they got the proposal. So um, if you don't get a, um, a response to say like, thank you, your proposal has been submitted, thank you, we got your application form, I would definitely do a follow up either by phone call or email just to say, I just want to check you got it, I'm, it that we're in there with you know with the, this current call or. Um, if it's for an open a general and they open the whole year round, I would say maybe give it like a week and just say like, I just want to check, you know, did you, did you get a, you know, did you get my proposal? And, um, and then if, and then just check when they say, um, a lot of them will say now, if you don't hear from us within six weeks, assume that you were unsuccessful. So, so wait until that time. And if you don't hear again, um, I think it's very possible to follow up with an email and just say, um, or, you know, maybe give it a bit more time. I've done that and said, um, you know, we didn't hear from you, unsuccessful. Would you recommend that we applied again? Um, you know, don't, don't hound donors. Don't, you know, be emailing them every week. Like we haven't heard, we haven't heard, or like, why didn't we get it? Or, you know, like use your, you know, common sense because they, they, at the moment people are getting like thousands more proposals than they can even look through you know so um they're getting always oversubscribed and they you know they're busy people as well so i think use your discretion but it's i think you'll you know you've done a lot of work you've done put in a lot of time to do that proposal so i think you you know within your right to um to to ask you know do, you know was there any feedback um, 
and sometimes it might be just an automated response you know like or oh, sorry we just run out of funding or yeah so that's this. thank you any other uh, questions for sophie please feel free to um unmute yourself and ask the question yes. the real people out there <laughs> Uh, Sophie, do you, I mean, have you seen recently any specific funding around um, the COVID-19 for South Africa? Yeah, at the moment. We've spoken about. Yeah, um, obviously we talked about the NLC. There's been a few small funds that have come up and gone already, like Mergon. I don't know if you know much about Mergon Foundation. They, they did a specific call and a few of my clients got the funding um, got a bit of little bits of funding from them. Um, and then what I'm finding is a lot of, like the UK is giving to the UK, like they're looking after their own charities and their own organizations and their own um, people in need. So um, I haven't found a lot of international funders apart from people that are funding the, like the PPE and the masks and getting hospitals ready and research. There is so much money out there for research. If you are in, if you want to do some research into, you know, how is this thing happening and how are we going to stop it in vaccines? I mean, that's where like masses and masses of the international funding is going into the research side of it. So it will be interesting. Like I'm interested to see what, what is going to happen you know, once this is gonna, you know, over or, you know, we're coming out of lockdown or when things do start to open up and change and we can sort of see a semblance of normalcy where people are getting jobs back and, and not needing maybe food relief um, in the long term, like where's that money going? The solidarity fund, I'm, I'm curious. I, I haven't even seen um, people being able to apply. I I don't know if anybody else has experience of that. I um, um, Maybe. Yeah, I see Merle is mentioning the Solidarity yes. Fund and the GAP Fund. I also, I have not heard anything positive, um, even from the small and medium enterprises who are trying to get funding from the Solidarity Fund. Although I, you know, I guess it's a, a because there's so many applications, it's a time consuming process. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, there was a question um someone's right at the beginning or an expectation about um what is shifts at the moment and shifts made by donors and i just wanted to make a comment that what i'm seeing what i'm really struggling to find funding for for a lot of my clients is the like ongoing um programs that are like in you know hospice in healthcare or um a school education that is doing regular like like looking after people and schooling and education and the funders are wanting to fund you know innovation and technology and um something that you know they can really put their brand on um and um, you know stuff that's already funded by the um, department of education or the department of health or department of social development it's not it's not just at the moment I'm finding it's not something that like donors are like, oh, I'm, you know, want to fund that. I'm struck, you know, it's a, it's a slog to find that funding. Um, but if you, you know, if you're an ECD, there's a lot of funding out there for, like, if you want to do something innovative or if you want to develop an app that's going to, you know, reach a lot of, a lot more people as opposed to just, I'm just wanting to feed and educate 30 kids, you know, like that sort of funding to like, I'm struck, like it's a struggle. It's, it's hard to find those funders out there, but if you're doing something in gender or, you know, in the, in the, you know, innovative or technology space, there's a lot to me that's like, what I'm seeing is there's a lot more funding out there for that sort of thing. Um, and advocacy and that sort of, yeah. Is that your experience Shireen as well? Yeah, I think one of the things around uh, around this um, innovation funding and so on is that there's a lot of, if you look at the alerts from funds for NGOs, for example, there's a lot about challenges, you know, a challenge for this and a challenge for that. And, and it's about, I mean, the problem for me with that is almost creating competition between NGOs. Yeah. But they also looking for innovation. So the idea is, okay, we a lot of what we've been doing is not working. So yeah. find us new ways of doing things. And a lot of that is, you know, what kind of technology can we leverage? How can we scale impact? 
Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I feel that that's a bit of a double-edged sword because I, I just think that, um, you know, worrying about innovation and so on, NGOs exist for a specific purpose, particularly those who work with specific communities and so on. Mm. Um, so I think um, part of this challenge thing and the innovation is also that funding is shifting away from, you'll see a lot of funders are shifting funding away from the normal grant making to to these challenges and um, innovations. Yeah. Yeah, like there's a nice, there was a nice, um, there's a fund now called um, the Innovation Edge, which is, a, which is into ECD, um, or specifically not to six year olds and also, you know, pregnant mothers. Um, and they, they, they fund, yeah, innovation or, or ideas that can go national. I think that's another thing, like if you can scale a project so you know some after school clubs or after school programs or ones that you can replicate into other communities and scale and go national those are also ones that are getting funding because because um, people want to see impact and greater numbers so the innovation edge is one of those and and then they recently did a call and um, specifically for covid related um innovations that are happening for for anyone between the age of 0 and 6. So that was open last month. Again, they had a very small window. You had to get it in within a few, I think it was 10 days. Um, so a few, we did a few applications for that, um, that are, you know, up specifically in like towards gender-based violence or um, helping, helping that sort of age range as well with issues that are happening around the lockdown. Um, so that was another one that's sort of out there again in the innovation, um, innovation, um, Stand. Yeah. Thanks, Sophie. Any questions about the databases specifically? Anything you you wanting to know about how to use them, how effective they are, which ones to start with? Um, Sophie, can you give us because you said we should start with one. Um, which one would you recommend for uh, either a new small organization or a you know a, a fundraiser who's doing this kind of work? Which is the one that you would recommend to start yeah. with? Um, so if you're looking, if you literally have zero budget and like, you know, you want to just find something free, then use um, funds for NGOs, the website, because um, that is, it's, it's got a lot on there. I would, I would really recommend getting, getting the, the Papillon directory because it's 800 Rand as a once off and you'll have it for life. Um, because even though the donors will, ch will change how, what they fund um, and it's um you know it's 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 going to be one that you can use for years um and the, the donors will still be there they might change their processes but you can then up, just update the excel yourself and 800 grand for um for getting regular updates as well it's to me um just a really good use of use of you know money um and save so much time and then because then there's so many databases on there then you can just start with um, so there is the option of obviously just to buy them individually. So you can just buy the South African one. Um, so go on their website and see exactly um, the different um, packages they, they offer. Um, and then you can just start with the South African, corp, you know, the corporates or the South African trusts, because trusts are really a nice way to start like with, with um, corporate funding because um, it's, it's more like that's specifically what they do. You know, the corporates is, this is like an an arm of what they do. Whereas the trusts, you know, the Ackerman Family Foundation Trust, that's what they do. They're, they're the um, family and it's board of trustees and they every month sit down and look through proposals and decide are we gonna give who we're gonna give our money to. So um those the the trusts are really nice ones to start with um because um they that's what they do, you know, like it's not um does that make sense? Yeah. Like hmm. the, yeah. So maybe I would say start with the and look through the, the trusts and see um, where you fit in with those. And they're very much like about people, people to people with the trust, because they're they're usually sort of trustees that sit sit around a table and they like love what they do and they're passionate about just giving away this money that's sitting there. Um, and they love coming to visit and it's about connecting with their hearts. Um, so those are really nice. Um, some of the trusts that we've built relationships with, then they you know give for years, and a few now gave specifically you know an extra ten thousand rand for the um, COVID related stuff, or an extra twenty thousand rand that wasn't it wasn't a proposal, it wasn't um, 
um, part of part of their usual giving, you know, um, but that's so that those those ones building relationships with trusts is a really um, and, and, and often like they'll fund for three years and then they'll be looking looking for new ones. Again, they're obviously oversubscribed all the time now, but but if you can get in there, um, they mm. like trust them really um, and they're on that um, database as well, a whole list of those. There's a question uh, about M and E. I mean, it doesn't necessarily link to the databases, but how, Sophie, have you worked with clients who have weak M and E systems to to respond to funders who do want some level level of measuring of impact? Yeah, so it's a, it's one that like it's like a cart before the horse. Like you need to have this stuff in place to be able to 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 even be considered in a in a grant application um because they're going to ask those questions they're going to ask you okay what are your outcomes what are your outputs what's your impact how are you showing that how are you proving that like um so um it's so it's looking through and um i'm just trying to read the question now going to measure impact yeah so there's a lot of training out there on on m and e um, but I'm just trying to think just to just to simplify it that the one really great way is to is to start mapping what you, what you are already funding what um, sorry what you are already measuring and, and what you you know what you would like to be measuring so it's all about proving your impact so if you say that this this um, training is going to result in a change in knowledge a change in in attitude um, uh, they're gonna you, whatever whatever it is that you're trying to prove, then you need to be able to you know to show that to demonstrate that through statistics and stories. So those are the two you know your two ways you're gonna you're gonna really use. I try to squeeze stories in wherever I can into grant proposals just to show like here's one person who um, you know one of the schools I work in. It works with a lot of youth at risk and um i use this story all the time because it was a 15 year old who was she got pregnant and she um her school basically said like don't don't come back so school the, the school i work with took her in and um she she had the baby at 16 and um three days i think something like 10 days later she was back at school she did her matric she graduated she got full scholarship to university of Stellenbosch, and she's now a teacher she's been teaching now for a number of years in a school you know in a primary school and she you know she says herself like oh i would have been a probably been a pregnant a pregnant cliched school dropout if it wasn't for the project mm. and so i just try and like even just a small story like that like i try and squeeze it into really you can talk about the numbers and you can say this how many were grad you know how many matriculating and how many are being impacted but um to also bring in those stories as well and um, of just like the one just to just to really make it about people you know then mm. they will connect with her story and say okay here's you know here's here's the actual person that was impacted um so um so i think getting those and then having all of the data you know you need to have the 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 forms and the baseline studies and if you say you're going to do a training then be able to show like this is what they knew at the beginning and this is what they now know because of because of the training and then this is what they did as a result of the training like they've now put this into place because of this um so those are the sort of um m and e that you need in place um yeah and just to be able to communicate that impact um in whatever way where you can is that yes thanks anyone else uh, like to make a comment observation share anything some of our fundraisers here are uh sharing some great information on the chat please do feel free yeah. to mute unmute yourself and speak to us tell us how you've yeah. been using databases or what has worked for you in your in your scenario mel marisol chantal do you want to share with us a little bit your experiences how you find funders um what what works for you in terms of searching on re donor research hi everybody hi sophie hi um, hi shireen thanks hi, for that Michelle. session it was really great mm -hmm. um so just uh, some background info we just sent out an appeal in march um with a target of about 168,000, 
and we were blown away. It wasn't, it was a soft appeal. And um, we've been inundated with donations coming from all over the world. So it came from various sources, being our regular donors, who we sent a mass email to. Um, and then it was also an article in the Daily Maverick and we've had a huge response from all over the world people coming to us asking how they can help and then there was also some activists we had from um big companies where we had this one um gentleman who did a marathon around his home a 50 kilometer marathon around his home and he had all his family and friends and business contacts contribute um, we got donations from South Korea, USA, all over, all over the world. <laughs> and they pledged for every kilometer that, um, you know, this um, marathon was at this person's home. So that raised quite a bit of money. And we're still seeing the donations come in, even though, you know, it's, it's starting to slow down. But yeah. what we plan to do now with our second term newsletter is to give a report to all those um, donors. Obviously, we ask them for their permission to send them our newsletter. Mm -hmm. And those new donors who've indicated, yes, please send us, they will then get the full report of how the money was spent and what our plan is for the next three months. Um, it's obviously nothing is set in stone at the moment. So we've just got like a three phased approach. So with the schools phasing in, we'll continue with um, school feeding for those grade seven and 12 learners. Then we'll try to do the parcels that we've been doing now for the learners who are at home and not able to get to school. And then we've also partnered with community kitchens so that our reach can be greater in areas where we don't do school feeding. So we've had a lot of um, other organizations like the Molniton Cans, some churches, various different organizations that have come on board as well. And all of this contributed to the um, 12 million I was talking about. It's amazing, amazing, Chantal. And yeah, I've, I've noticed that's what I've um, noticed at the moment. It's people are getting money through um, through the, the sort of campaigns that you're talking about, through um, getting uh, ambassadors and people out there too. Yes. Because people want to be, they want to help, they want to do, feel like they're doing something as well. Um, and and at the moment, not not a lot of grant normal grants are sort of happening or people are saying we're just waiting to see we haven't met with our boards you know so so this is the way you know that people are going to get funding put your yeah put your um, mailer out there and um, get a backer buddy get a um get a giving game site going and to to really enter and, and i'm sure what you did is make it like very tangible like give a hundred rand yes. and it will feed this many children mm -hmm. yes yes that's what we've done Chantel, can you just share with us about, uh, is there any other databases that you guys use? I saw you said something about Bread for Life or something. Oh, so I don't know if you know Blisters for Bread. Blisters That's for Bread, how, sorry. Yes, we've been doing Blisters for Bread for 51 years now, going on 52 years. Mm -hmm. So um, we've gathered information from those walkers over all the years. We normally get about 13,000 walkers a year. Mm -hmm. Some years it's a little bit less, but we work around 13,000. So we have those um, walkers who are our donors as well. And whatever mass emails or communication we send out to, that is the, the donor base that I'm talking about. And then besides the blisters for bread donor, ba uh, donor database, we have our regular donors. Um, They've been with us since 1958. So it's individuals, um, <laughs> corporates, trusts and foundations. So those people get our emails apart from the blisters for bread. We don't really um, use the funds for NGOs and all the other things that's available. Um, I'm definitely going to look into that so that we can um, gain more traction in the international, in international funding. I think historically it's just been the um, individuals that have stuck with us. Mm -hmm. We have donors that are still in, like in May 90s, that still give every month. Um, we're lucky to have um, bequests 
where we get a lot of bequests. Um, we got get a lot of support from the Rotary Clubs. We were started by the Rotary Club um, of Farden Island, and they it was a group of um, children in 1960 who started the Blisters for Bread, mm. and it carried on every year. Mm. We also deal with a lot of um, schools that do mini Blisters for Bread, so a lot of different things happening. Shanta, what's amazing about that is that you then have kept, it's about donor relations for all those yes. years because those people keep giving, yes. because, yeah, because you nurture those relationships and that's so good yes. with, with individuals and with the, you know, with the, with, um, fun, you know, funders as well is that you, you build those relationships, you know, you, with the grant manager as well, like, and so that's amazing that that's, you know, you've been able to do that for, for years and to keep, keep it going, you know. Mm. Yes, and we use a system called Salesforce. I'm not sure if anybody knows about Salesforce. So that's key for us in, um, you know, sending out email reminders to renew donations annually or to know exactly which donations are recurring monthly. Yeah. Um, that is what we use mainly for our individuals. And then for corporates, we do, um, we have a doctor schools. So yes. corporates go out to the school, they visit the schools, they feed the learners and that's how they get involved. So there's a lot of um, communication and, and how can I say, yeah, lots of engagement yes. with corporates before they actually adopt a school. So that's why we haven't really worked off um, these lists that are available because we've been nurturing the corporates that we already have and we have a very good marketing and communication strategy. We're always updating our Facebook page, our website's up to date. We do Facebook Live so when there's events happening, people can be part of it and experience it, you know? So I think that's, be, that's what's yeah. working for us is that our name is out there. We always... Um, on the radio when big events are happening like this is for bread so yeah. so the Cape Town Western Cape community knows um, yeah. about the SFA and and they can see what we're doing so mm. when it, when we call on them they are more than willing to help yeah mm. I think that's so that's such a good um, reflection Chantal because I think many NGOs um, are grappling with that you know they they're not able to do that and I think my starting point is always nurture your existing donors first before yes. you bother about trying to find any new funders um, so you know invest in nurturing your relationship with your current funders because they can stay with you and they can also give you more Mm, um, yes. You know, it takes you much longer to to find a new funder. So I think that's an amazing example of how to nurture that relationship, how to keep the funders informed, whether they are institutional or individual, um, and how to to kind of build on you know the things that you already do um, to create awareness, to grow community, to be able to um, to raise funding in you know in that way. So thanks very much. I think that was an amazing. Um, input. Any final Thank comments you. before we end? Uh, Should, um, mm. I just comment about the database. And um, I've just recently, um, one of my clients uses uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, which has been great, obviously, for everything online now. It's an amazing resource. Like, it's just so nice because everything is on one place. Mm -hmm. So you can update the same doc, you can be updating the same document, you can be looking at it at the same time. It's amazing. And then there's a really nice um, CRM tool and um, called Dynamics that comes, that is a sort of an add on with with Microsoft Teams. I don't know about the pricing or anything, but it's amazing. It's like sales, it's very similar to Salesforce. Um, but it integrates them with Microsoft Teams, with all of, then anytime I now send an email to a, de a donor, it tracks it, it tracks it on there. Um, so then you can see the whole history, which is similar, which, which Salesforce does as well. But it, um, it's just, it's a really nice, there's another one to just look at. So I know and, and I think, uh, I mean, what to say about that is that you don't, if you're a small organization and so on, and you don't need to have, these elaborate databases um, in order to make something work, right? You can really have an Excel sheet, 
but the thing that we talked about earlier about coordination and planning and something someone holding the process together updating it regularly and so on i think that's also important so don't feel like you now have to find money to buy salesforce and you know all of those kind of things unless you have the resources you have a really big database of funders or mm -hmm. individual funders and so on you know then it's worth thinking about how to how to leverage those technologies but you can really start small i've been doing some research for a client around starting a new fund uh, a new feminist fund and the, um, the conversations we've had with international feminist funds is really about start small start simple you know, some have just used an an uh, a data a, an Excel sheet to create a database. So so really, don't feel overwhelmed by needing the the technology. No, Excel Excel is brilliant. Like you can use that, and yeah, yes, Excel works yes. very well. So, I think the point is more about the the capacity to make sure that these things are being tracked, that it's uh, updated, that it's being managed, um, and that's the thing. So even if you use these databases, because in fact we recently bought the Papillon database, including the uh, it's the international and the South African one. It was on special, I think, for one thousand three hundred. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like, like I'm so glad I joined. I was here because I like didn't know where to start. <laughs> You know, it's so many of them. It's yeah. like, okay, what what to do now? And it's not that we want funding, it's more for our clients. Yes. So I think it's also about, you know, starting small, trying to figure out a way that works for you and then, um, you know, growing from there instead of thinking you now need to have all the databases and so on because just in fact having the time to do the funding research you know, because there's always something else that's a priority and so on. So having additional capacity, in fact, I'm thinking about finding an intern yes, to just, just the data, that. the donor research on a monthly yeah. basis for all the clients, yeah. you know, so it's finding ways that work for you rather than thinking now you need to get all these databases and then they just sit somewhere and you never get to them. So, yeah. you know, think about it in a very practical way and, and how you can use them. Any you final know, just, thoughts from you, Sophie? I was just going to say, use your volunteers. I mean, like if you've got if you've got young in volunteers or interns, like they know how to do research, they know how to use the internet, and so give them one of the databases and say, just go through and see if you know are we relevant? What's the application process? Are they open now? Like, you know, and um, I you know often had a like an assistant sort of in when I was a fundraising manager in a in an organisation to do that because it is time consuming. Um, but it can be done, you know, it's just research. So yeah, use use your team, the teams that you have and volunteers. So. Okay. okay, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sophie. I think that was um, very enlightening for most of us who think we know about databases, but actually know very little. Um, and I think the the tips you gave about how to use the databases um, I think that was really useful you know and the and what you know what could work and what doesn't work and so on and then those other new ones that I didn't know about the the Welsh one um, <laughs> the peak proposals I didn't know about those so I think those were you know um, that was like a value add for us as well so Thank you very much. Um, what we will do is we will send, um, we normally send a link where you can access the, the presentations as well as the recording um, for your own use further or to share with your colleagues. So we will do that um, in the next day or so. We will share that with everyone. Um, we want to thank you again very much for uh, being here today, for participating in this webinar. We, We'd love to hear your feedback. So we will also send an evaluation um, form link with the, with the follow-up email. And we'd really appreciate your feedback on this and it will help us to also uh, improve and add um, topics that you are interested in in the future. So thank you everyone. Um, have a lovely weekend and we will see you soon. Thanks everyone. Bye.